So that's how simple this little pattern is. You're just buying a new closing high. Look, one day it's Thursday, August 29th, 2024. And this is the week in charts. I've been to a plethora of your shows. Well, thank you, John. I like when you use the word plethora. It means a lot. <laughs> so what are we talk about? Well, uh, first of all, I want to thank all you guys and girls for attending. I almost forgot to do that. Uh, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here, as I was just saying right before we went live. Well, obviously, current market conditions, your questions on trading, feel free to punch those in as we go. Your favorite stock and crypto picks. We'll go crypto first, and then we'll go to stocks. And then this week, I want to continue the methodology in action. I think that's an important thing for me to do every week. And I'm going to build on that week after week, I believe. And we've got a couple of mystery charts. We've got a new one. And we've got a couple of reveals. Sticking with the trend and a brief 10% update. I'm going to touch briefly on a million little things. There's not a whole lot I want to get into this week. I want to focus mostly on the methodology. And then obviously, we'll get into the market and talk about a lot of things there. And again, any questions that you may have. There's a slim screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future. And a lot of stuff can happen to me now. And then, of course, from Greg Morris. There's my contact information. Once again, if you need to screenshot that or just uh, hit pause if you're watching the recording. And by the way, if you like this video, please like it. If you don't like it, go have no fun somewhere else. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action so we have two mystery charts to reveal this week first one is sky w and this was in the service the uh by the way just just in case you're on the service and you're confused about this i guess i should put uh date originally recommended so this was originally recommended on the 15th so you can see it went a long 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 time this one and the aig which we'll take a look at in just one second without triggering so long in fact that i took it off of the potential setups anyway as i said a couple of weeks ago or last week it was headed higher but then lost some momentum and then traded sideways for a while you could see it did make all-time highs but then came in came back in from that and then began to sell off creating a bow tie if you look down below you could see the bow tie proper order 10 grade and 20 20 grade and 30 10 simple 20 exponential 30 exponential as i say each week went from green or uptrend proper order to downtrend proper order where the 10 is less than 20, 20 is less than 30. Over a short period of time, yellow means that they're either uptrend or downtrend proper order. When you see you go from green to red really quickly, especially if there's no yellow in between, those are usually your best bow ties. Uh, three to four days is ideal. I'll go maybe a little bit more longer than that. And keep in mind that it's still gonna be a first thrust or likely some other pattern that I trade, even though it might not be officially a bow tie. But anyway, the entry was here and you could see it just went on and on and on and on and never did trigger. All right, the second reveal, I'm just gonna go back to that just for one second. You can see again, like I just said, it just kept going higher and higher. And I actually recommend, I didn't realize I had recommended this uh, way back here. So, and not that it, this stock is not still in trouble. It doesn't look too pretty still but it's no longer really uh, fitting the methodology. And the other reveal would be AIG. And let me just remind you of that. Here are your parameters down here. You can see that uh, they're roughly the same price, but because the volatility is a little different, the Sky W a little bit more volatile than the AIG, I used a slightly smaller stop on that one. So keep in mind, the stops are gonna vary if you look at this ULS, it wasn't extremely volatile and was also a lower price at the time. So we actually use a five point stop and that's 12% initial risk. Uh, I was reading, I'm gonna be speaking about Jesse Livermore in a couple of weeks in San Francisco. And so I'm rereading everything I can get my hands on. And then I'm looking through, geez, I don't know how many it was. I remember I started a series thinking I'd take three or four weeks to do it. And three or four months later, I was still knee deep into it or neck deep into it. But anyway, uh, one of the things that I read that he said that, or at least in the biography about him, said if he was down 10%, he'd get out. The only problem with that is some of the stocks that we trade might bounce around 10% in a day. And as I've said at nauseum, there's a popular methodology out there that says get out at 8% loss. 
well, you know, we could take another look at NNE in a minute. Something like that would move 8% in three or four minutes. And so that would be, that would instantly knock you out. You have to be outside of that normal noise. Otherwise, you'll get stopped out on noise alone. But anyway, you can see this one made kind of a triple E top look at thing, a quadruple top, depends on how you want to count that. But definitely was not making much forward progress, even though it made some new highs here and there. It just really didn't follow through to the upside. Sharp, sharp sell-off. Uh, not so much a bow tie on this one, kind of a sloppy bow tie, if you want to call it that. But it's a first thrust, which is also a tradable pattern. Also, look at all this overhead supply. And so far, it's kind of pushing into it, which is kind of surprising to me. But so far, it also has it triggered. So the pullback just kept pulling back, pulling back, pulling back, pulling back. And never did trigger, so no capital was put into harm's way. As I've said before, I'll probably get an email six months from now on that one. It'll be probably at two hundred dollars a share, and they're like, "What should I do?" <laughs> I'm like, I, uh, "I don't think I recommended that. It was going straight up." And they're like, "Yes, you did. Well, it never triggered, so you should have taken it." Uh, I know I'm kind of making light of that, but I am kind of shocked. At, at how much that one little thing, and hopefully, let me see if I have it on the list here. If not, it needs to be on the list. I don't see it right off. It's got to be on here on the million little things list. But uh, if it's not, I should add it in next week or actually a little housekeeping. I won't be doing a show next week or the week after. Next week's a holiday week. It's kind of hard to get a show together. Plus, I need to sometimes at some point get serious about getting that presentation together. I got to finish that presentation for San Francisco. And the following week is San, is San Francisco. But anyway, um, getting back to the methodology in action, here's ULS. And notice that it began to take off. This was an IPO. It took off and accelerated higher, then began to pull back. So these core methodology patterns can work really nicely in IPOs. And IPOs are extremely inefficient. And John, who's here tonight, John Ross, he's taken the ball and, and ran with that. And we've been kind of talking via private messages we need to kind of expand upon that at some point in time but uh, we hadn't quite hashed it out but anyway uh the core methodology works really well in ipos i'll show you another little pattern i like here in just one second as as an example and the entry was right around here stop, stop was down here ipt was here we hit the ipt and that's uh here's my trades and what i call my model account if I recommend 400 shares in the service, I do take that actual trade. I use a little bit of discretion here and there, but for the most part, I try to at least mimic, especially in my model account, whatever I say. And in that way, it's it's um, it's my skin on the line too. And I think that makes me a better trader, not to be vain or anything, but that's why you'll see me get like really, really selective sometimes when the market's uh, is kind of chopped around, like it has lately, or it doesn't quite fit the methodology. The market won't all, like last week, if, if you get really bored or can't sleep, go in and watch last week's Dave Landry's The Week of Charts, where I talked a lot about uh, you can't kiss all the women because sometimes people regret that, that they'll see a stock take off without them. And they're like, damn, I wish I could have gotten on, on board. Well, if it doesn't set up for your methodology and you should be following a fairly specific method, methodology, then you should not take the trade. Now, there are some cases, and I'll show you in one second, uh, where, yes, you could buy markets that are just going straight up, but uh, there's a lot of caveats involved with that, and we'll get to that in just one second. Anyway, my buy was actually right here on this line here. I don't know why it's over there. And then we sell half at the IPT. I think it was about four points on that IPT, so that's $902. I was supposed to get a little bit more, probably four points, I would guess, or a little bit more than that. And I don't know exactly why I sold uh, a little shy of the IPT. But again, it's close enough in this particular case. And I do try to, uh, and the again was, I do try to match whatever I recommend the service as much as possible. And I did a mark to market based on today's close. And just 200 shares are left in, in the model account, of course. And that's worth 29.46, knock on wood. That's an extra 250 something to $300 from last week. So, so far, so good. 
I expect, I don't want it, I don't hope it happens, but uh, I expect we'll have some drawdowns along the way on this, more than we've seen probably in the past because it, the volatility has picked up a little bit. And as price gets higher and higher, it's going to move around more on a point basis too. But that comes with the territory. We have a, a loose trailing stop. And yes, it always hurts in the end. And we talked about that last week at Bandcamp. But longer term trend following is where the money is. Now, again, not to keep reiterating what I beat the dead horse so much, but we get in for the swing trade and we stick around if the party continues. So here's this week's mystery chart. This is a good looking chart. I've been watching that one forever. And you can see I've got it down here. All the information you need to know right down here. A little tease there. <laughs> By the way, that was the that's the ULS. So 2980 in the model portfolio for a total of 3980. That's the only stock we have left. Just kind of random thoughts. Even though the market sort of tanked a while back, we're still holding on because we didn't get stopped out. And so far the market has come back nicely. Now, will it continue to come back? I don't know. I have some concerns, and we'll get to that when we get to the live charts. But anyway, so that's a recommendation for tomorrow. Uh, today's the 29th. Uh, so this actually should have been the 29th instead of the 28th here. But I'm pretty close, and I'll fix that. Anyway, this thing sort of gradually worked its way higher, and then it began to accelerate higher very nicely. Also notice, and you can see I have a line drawn through the bars. Notice that there's some really nice persistency, meaning that the stock tends to go up day after day after day. And mathematically, it's equivalent to linear regression. I just like to draw lines through charts, through the through as many bars as I can intersect. And you can see that that's a fairly solid trend. I have a pattern called, or setup called uh, persistent pullbacks, where I think, I, I think one of the rules is 20 bars of persistency, but over time, and that's 20 years ago, I guess, since I published a pattern, I've noticed that shorter and shorter term persistency is still quite useful. And I think I noticed that back in, it might have been like 2009, or I forget exactly when, but it was a long time ago when I was in Italy, and there was this big, there's a huge screen behind me. That's back when trade shows were massive. I had a there was like 500 people in the audience, which was like, <laughs> it was a little scary. But when I was looking up at the charts to explain things, it was really cool because these bars were like three and four feet high, each bar. And I noticed that even just three or four or five of these bars that were stacking on top of each other were, were relevant as far as a, a relevant technical pattern. So pay a lot of attention to persistency and i think you're going to be very happy with that and you are welcome so nice little pullback here this thing has gone so far and so fast i'd actually like to see a little bit deeper pullback but i feel like it's a setup right now that if i didn't take i would be pissed <laughs> maybe that's i think i reworded it a little bit more eloquently but that's one of the million little things it's like if you're looking at a setup and you feel like you'd be crazy not to take it, then that's a setup that you should take. And then you kind of time travel and like this thing takes off and you're not in it. Would it really, really frustrate you because it's part of your methodology and you should have taken it? Not because it's just going up, but because it's part of your methodology. Hello, Matt. Good morning. What time is it over there? Matt's waking up with us. Entries there, he's down under. And uh, I believe they call it Melbourne. Melbourne. Entries there, a stop is down here. Now, that's a pretty wide berth, okay? Percentage wise, that's huge. It's probably uh, round numbers. It's probably like a 20% stop, but this stock is an HV over 100, and that's what it calls for. But it does trade fairly cleanly, even though it's got such a crazy HV. And it's a TKO type of pullback, a little bit of a pullback, a little bit of a TKO trend knockout. Anyway, IPT is up here. So we'll see what happens. And if it triggers, I'll reveal it next week. If we pull it off, I'll also reveal it. I want to do a qu quick 
TFM 10% system, simply because the market got a little questionable not that long ago. And in some cases, I think it still could be questionable. It's, it's really mixed out there. Some sectors are doing really well and some sectors not so much. And we'll flesh all that out in just one second. Anyway, so where are we now with TFM 10% system? Well, the zones here, which is uh, the zones were inspired by Jeff. My, my original zone, so to speak, was just a 10% line. It was just a line. And anything below 10% of the 50-week closing high means that the market is likely in trouble. My premise there is just technical analysis 101. Kind of like the buy at B, which I'll mention again in a second, spoiler alert is that if a market is go from A to C and B is somewhere in between, it's gonna to have to pass through B, okay? You can't just always buy at B like I often say, but in some cases you can, and I'll, I'll get to that in just one second. If you're watching a um, a trader, if you're watching methodology in action as a separate playlist, go back and look at the weekly charts for 08, 29, 24, which hasn't been published yet, but. It will be by the time you're seeing this on YouTube. Anyway, so Jeff said he likes to get out the way when the market is 5% or more away from the 50-week closing high. Now, he's going to get a few more whipsaws, but he's also going to stay out of trouble should the market tank and keep on going. Now, the original system, just I know I've talked about a thousand times, so just you guys that are here, bear with me just one second, uh, that are always here, I should say, or familiar with the system. But my original intent is kind of borrowing a line of reasoning from Ian McActivy or borrowing a line from Ian McActivy is you want to avoid that diaper change moment where the market just implodes and you're just like kind of freaking out. And so my original intent was, okay, if we got below 10% of that 50-week closing, I get out of the way. And then I added a whipsaw filter of the 50-week closing, 50-week simple moving average. So... I said I wouldn't get it all rules, and there I go. <laughs> so anyway, that's the rules. If you close 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high and below that 50-week simple moving average, then you need to get out. You can see my YouTube channel for a lot more on that, especially the trader quick clips. I might even have a, a short on this, a YouTube short. Anyway, that was the last sell signal there. The, the NASDAQ and the Qs did not trigger a sell signal, which was kind of cool. And I'll get to that in just one second. The buy is a little bit more stringent. Uh, it's a little whipsaw filter. As I've said before, you have to be really careful with whipsaw, whipsaw filters. Whipsaw filters that keep you from going in and out. Um, a whipsaw is this big old huge saw the lumberjacks used to use back before chainsaw was invented. And uh, but anyway, whipsaw is like in and out, in and out, in and out. It just knocks you. You get in, you get knocked out. You get in, you get knocked out. Uh, it happens or shit happens, I guess. I don't. I'm not too worried about monetization. Uh, but shit happens, right, in markets, and you will get whipsawed. But the point I'm trying to get to, and believe it or not, I have one, is if you put in a lot of whipsaw filters, too many of them to try to avoid all peril and catch all trends, what will happen is you'll end up curve fitting to the past data. And believe me, the future data does not equal the past data. If it did, you probably would never see my fat ass again, but everybody else would figure that out too. Then the, the edge would come out and there would no longer be a market. So that's why, that's one of the things that's kind of hard to wrap your head around. But the reason the reason the market is a market is because markets are imperfect and people are imperfect and emotions run rampant in markets, both as crowd behavior and individual behavior. And that's what makes a market. But anyway, you want to make things as simple as possible. And that's a point I'll get to again in a second. So you want two bars of Landry light, which is um, reminiscent of the 220 EMA breakout system, which I now call the 230 EMA breakout system because I like the 30 EMA better than the 20, as I've said quite often. In more recent years but anyway two bars of landry light that means the lows are greater than the moving average in this case moving average is a 50 week simple moving average i like a simple moving average for this i actually it's kind of hard to wrap your head around but you actually want a little lag in a longer term 
trend following system because if it catches up the price too fast, you're likely to get knocked out. Now, longer term trend following systems have have their nuances and have the, and, and a lot of them weren't that good. Okay, that's that's where the money is, and that's where we make all of our money, and most of it, I should say. But the drawdowns can be brutal, and that's why we're taking partial profits along the way. Now, I didn't build profits taking into this. I probably should have in hindsight, as you'll see here in just one second. But anyway, the sell signal is less stringent. My thinking is get out the way, sell first, and ask questions later. And we're way up here towards the top of the range. When you look at the weekly chart, it kind of helps you to get that 30,000-foot view. But uh, you still have to get to new highs and stay there, I, ideally. Anyway, so the buy was back there, two bars of Landry lights, and any close above the 10% line or the 10% zone, as we now call it. Now, if you take a look at the NASDAQ, it's kind of shocking and believe me, it was it was much higher than this. But uh, I was looking at my brokerage account and I saw it, it said 50 something percent. I'm like, no, there's no way I'm up that much on this position. Uh, Qs, that is. But uh, I am. I, I, and this is like a. I'm not bragging. I, I got in sort of like for S and Gs. Like, okay, let's see if I could follow a mechanical system. I'm more of a discretionary guy, and I have a lot of money management built into things. But this has no money management. This is just a pure trend following system. It's going to have drawdowns, obviously, but the drawdowns aren't horrible because you're, you're stopped at a 10%. But 10% can be, once obviously you get to 500, you're getting at 300, that could be substantial. Like I said last week, that's an $8,000 haircut, at least a couple of weeks ago it was. But so far, I'm up 176.67. And again, it was it was much prettier than that not that long ago. By the way, you have to close below the 50-week simple moving average and 10% or more away from the 50-week closing high. Those are the two caveats. But the system was designed around a calendar week. So that would have to happen on a Friday. You'd have to close out the week. So I could see where there could be a potential for the market to have a significantly bigger than 10% move and below that 50 week moving average. But I'm gonna follow it like it was designed years ago. I'm not gonna change the system once I'm in it and we'll just wanna see what, we'll just see what happens here. And knock on wood, it's been a pretty good run for now. But the stop is way down here, it looks like 426. And you know, we were up over 500, like I said a minute ago, that's an $8,000 swing. and. That's gotten a little bit better. That moving average is coming up a couple of points each week. And ideally, it'd be great if that moving average got above the 10% line so it wouldn't be as much of a heartache and headache when it does eventually stop out. And as I've said quite a bit, when I bought 100 shares, it was kind of like an s g trade. I just thought it'd be kind of fun to see what would happen. And then once it went up 100 points or whatever it went up 50 something percent then all of a sudden it, it started becoming real money pretty quickly all right let me just shift gears here i want to do a brief uh, some couple of thoughts on the landry 100 it kind of dovetails in with something i read and reread by livermore recently and this is, um, I did a, a Kindle search, and it's several times he's mentioned this throughout the book. He was talking about one stock that was at brand new highs, and people wouldn't go near it, but it didn't seem to bother him. At 164, prices look mighty high, but as I've told you before, stocks are never too high to buy or too low to sell. The price per se has nothing to do with establishing my line of least resistance. Well, as I've mentioned before, I rebooted the Landry 100, and the Landry 100 is uh, sort of a proof of concept type of thing, and I don't have real money on the line. Maybe someday, maybe I have to retire or something, or I, I never see myself retire, but partially retire. I was kind of thinking about it today. It's like uh, I'd have like a workshop, and then I'd have, I'd have monitors on one side of the workshop. Uh, I don't know why I don't do that now. Uh, I guess there's too much other stuff going on. 
But anyway, uh, it's kind of like a proof of concept type of thing where you you have a slot for 100 stocks, okay? And I'll grab the formula for you next week. It's about that big. That's a whole formula. It's just a, it has to be making a 52-week closing high. Now, I do remember last time I ran this, so to speak, when conditions were a little bit less conducive for like as far as like a bull market is concerned or a bull run, I did just kind of go to I'd go down from 52 week to to maybe as low as 90 day highs for the stocks to be a candidate for the list. But it's pretty amazing, and this one's had a pretty big drawdown that comes with the territory. One thing I was thinking about is earlier today is that I don't have any money management in this other than I go through it every night and decide who's going to get kicked out and who's going to get replaced, uh, who's going to replace the ones that were kicked out. And in some cases, if there's so many great stocks, they'll put, I'll just keep putting new stocks in and just kicking out, in some cases, even winners. But I figured let's hang on to this ASTS for now. Let's see if it can survive this little drawdown in here. And I will, I'm not going to throw caution to win. I'll, I'll eventually pull it out. And this is just, again, for S&Gs. But it's up over 200%. I think it was like 250% or more, maybe even much more, maybe 300% at the highs. And it's since pulled back. But the point I want to make, like Livermore said, you look at this stock and back at $9, whenever it triggered, that's a pretty high level. That was at least one year plus highs for the stocks. It wasn't all time highs, but it was one year plus highs. And you can see from there to where we are now, that's the 214% round numbers run. So a stock is never too high to buy. Now there's some caveats. I like a pullback, don't get me wrong, but for proof of concept, as far as momentum goes, if you were to buy 100 stocks and if your caveat was the stock had to make a new high for you to buy it, new closing high, then I think you would do okay longer term because you would you would occasionally catch this 200 and something percent move or 300 percent move or a thousand percent move and some stocks. Now, you can't just run out and buy new highs. I don't want to make it look like you can run out and buy new highs. This is to prove a concept. The problem with just buying new highs is you'd end up with like, let's say a half a dozen stocks in your portfolio. Well, that's that's not enough to ensure you're gonna capture that trend. I think you're better off trading something like a pullback. Uh, by the way, this stock is set up as a pullback, but it's 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 pretty crazy. <laughs> so uh, consider yourself warned should you try to go after it. But if you look at some of the other numbers in here, they're decent, okay? And, and if you look at the tracking date too, you can see this was on 6-6-24. Okay, just a couple of months ago. In fact, I started this, I guess, back in May is when I started my reboot on this. Late May, if, if memory serves. Because the oldest one I see, now this is not all 100, but the oldest one I see in the list looks like it's May 29th, but you can see the tracking date in here. And, you know, CDNA, 64% since uh, July 22nd. And, uh, if you yeah, if you want a copy of this list, I could I occasionally post it to my Facebook group group, but I'll I'll tweet it out tomorrow. First chance if you want to take a look at these on your own. But you can see that's a tracking date here, and that's a percentage gain. And these are the top percentage percentage ones. If I reverse this list, which I could certainly do and get the live charts, you'll see that there are some losses, but I do kick out the losers as they go. So this is a, a survivor's database, so to speak, okay? So you're going to see the better looking stocks in here. Like I said, a few weeks ago, maybe a couple of months ago when I first rebooted this, is that I'm doing a sort of a constant window dressing when it comes to this list. And, and again, I spent a lot of time on this a few months ago. So check that out if you can't sleep at night. And stealing a line from my buddy, Greg Morris, uh, don't operate heavy machinery after viewing. Okay, I mean, the only things, there's only a couple of things I wanted to talk about this week. I wanted to focus, like I said, mostly on the methodology and then, of course, the, the markets. But there's a couple of things I felt like I wanted to, to, to get out there, just based on recent interactions with, with some people that are a little newer to trading. 
I would recommend you seek simplicity over complexity. And if you can't put it on a cocktail napkin, toss it out, okay? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure I could probably draw you that TFM 10% system on a cocktail napkin. I could probably draw a TKO on a cocktail, cocktail napkin or anything else. And this is pretty much my entire methodology in a nutshell. <laughs> Sometimes, especially like if I'm speaking overseas, which I haven't done in a while, COVID kind of mucked everything up. It was kind of funny coming out of COVID. I was my phone was ringing again, like uh, everybody was so gung ho, like we're gonna we're gonna get you in, we're gonna do all this stuff, and I don't know. I did a lot of that too. It's like I look back at some of the things I said I was gonna do, and I did some of them, but not a lot. Life gets in the way, I guess. But uh, usually, for some reason, I don't know why it has to do with overseas, but uh, I'll put up a chart with like a thousand indicators on it and I'll say, well, if you understand this, you understand my methodology and people will get their cameras out and take pictures of it. And, and I'm like, this is a joke. Okay. It's then I'll show them persistent pullbacks, TKOs, all things of that nature. But this is the entire methodology in a nutshell. I, for the most part, except for a few little patterns here and there, I trade pullbacks and you want to make sure you get an entry, put a stop in. Your IPT gets hit, initial profit target that is, and then you trail that stop higher on the remainder of the shares. That's pretty much it. Now, keep it simple again. This is just a, this was a hot IPO, and it it just kind of came public, died out, and then it took off and pulled back, and that's it. Okay, and then the entry was here, stop was here, initial profit target was there. So it's a hot IPO, first deep retracement. And that one took off nicely. Unfortunately, it went up two or three hundred percent or whatever. That's fortunately, but then it 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 imploded, which is fine. And it stopped. It turned out to be a decent trade. We talked about it last week. You can check that out. But the drawdown was abysmal on this one, even after taking partial profits. But the point I'm trying to make is keep it super simple when it comes to your methodology and. As Linda Rass, Linda's going to be at this um, at this seminar. That's going to be cool to see her again. But as Linda Rasky says, all you need is one pattern to be successful. And, and I agree. You just need one setup, and that's all you need. And uh, John's here tonight. Uh, John does my stuff too, but he does the the IPO version of my stuff, and he's done really well with that. And that's why he and I are talking a lot about IPOs lately. But anyway, what's even cooler was – this was a buy at D, and not that I won't ever show you something if it's a good example, but for the most part, I'd say 95.8% of everything I show you, or maybe 99%, I publicly talked about before I took the trade. Now, if it's something like the I almost said the symbol <laughs> the aforementioned mystery chart going into tomorrow that's on the trading service and i know i'm teasing a little bit here but I, I, that's out of respect to my my clients who are paying for that and the facebook group is is the the gold members and i'll put out things like buy a d patterns there on occasion and some other uh, setups here and there but nne was a buy a d and here's the trades that I took on that one. Just a representative sample, 1,000 shares in this one particular account. Now, this wasn't the perfect example I wanted to show you for keep it simple, but I think it'll do. And the buy ID, you're buying on a new closing high with IPOs with a few caveats. You've got to have, you have to have adequate volume adequate range and then there's a day one rule day one sets a high for the week you have to that's also close above that high so if you were just trading a if this high was lower than this high if day one was not the high for the week the first opening week then uh, the buy b would be right here okay so that's how simple this little pattern is you're just buying a new closing high that's it it's kind of like the landry 100 but with ipos and then you are taking you are buying that new closing high. And that's because lots and lots of reasons, which I went into in the IPO course. But the main reason is everybody is happy at a new closing high. They're also hard to short, so it's no shorts in there. 
uh, trying to short it and muck things up. Man, eh, technically the the underwriter I guess could short it, or there's some complex rules which don't really mean a whole lot when it comes to trading. Other than for the most part, it can't be shorted. And there's a lot of excitement with IPOs as they make in these new highs. New highs elsewhere tend to kind of go unnoticed, although the closing high is a bit of a a stealthy type of thing. A trader many, many years ago told me that, where like you have a like market will make a high, like a brand new high here. And then later on, it'll make that new closing high. Well, that new closing high is kind of a stealthy thing because not everybody's screens light up or everybody notices it's made a new high. And that's kind of the thinking that I was thinking with the buy at B also, and you know, ABC as we talked about earlier. But the other thinking is if this IP is going to take off, it's going to make a new closing high first. By the way, and this is something I was putting out in the in the Facebook group, I think earlier this week, I was doing my IPO analysis and I was shocked at how many IPOs came public on day one and just died out and never took out, never took out that day one high. That simple little rule in and of itself will save you a lot of money when trading IPOs. But anyway, the new buy was uh, on this day here. And the next day I took a two point profit on that, which percentage wise, that's huge. So that's a thousand bucks. Now you'll notice that I did let this come back in on me a little bit. And what I was trying to do is I was trying to survive to see if this thing just, just kind of whips on right back in. Uh, I would almost prefer, I mean, it's a lot of fun when you get an IPO and the next day, you know, next morning you're taking profits. That's that's a lot of fun. I love doing that, don't get me wrong. But I'd much prefer that if they would take their time and then hit that IPT, initial profit target, and then consolidate or whatever, and then slowly take off, and then I'm in it for a long, long time. It's fun when you get in these bottle rocket sort of moves, so to speak, as I've discussed before. But a lot of times they're hard to for the market to sustain them. But anyway, the buy was there. And I flipped out half my shares. Now, technically, I, again, I should have been at break even, so shame on me. And I guess I wasn't watching the percentage loss or, or the, the money loss. So I did give up 345 on the second loaf. But net, net over two days, that's $655. Do the math on that. That's $82,255. Thereabouts, if you could do that every two days, <laughs> which I know you can't, but it's fun to do. You know, my wife's like, What's that thing you do? It's like annualizing, yeah, yeah. So, if you could make a hundred bucks a day, that's 25 grand a year. If you can make four hundred dollars a day, that's a hundred grand a year in the markets. Now, easier said than done, but it's something to, to respect for sure. Like, that's nothing to sneeze at making 650 bucks over a couple of days it, and you know it did turn into mother of all trends but hey next got a little um got a little walking around money ready for another trade anyway so keep it suit simple a uh, little bit slightly more complex pattern but certainly easy super easy to recognize super easy to trade the the caveats would be that you want to make sure the stock is persistent and accelerating and all the other things i've talked about recently and this stock fits the bill go in and watch the last two or three weeks of the week of charts but you can see we had lots and lots and lots of landry light like 60 bars or so so for 60 days the load never touched the 30 ema that's a very 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 impressive trend it was also accelerating as i'm just kind of eyeballing it here it looks like it had the, the three gear thing we talk about first gear second gear third gear so first gear back here, draw a turn line, worked away higher, then it accelerated higher, and then it had that third gear just kind of like taken off. Anyway, so the, the whole pattern for the, what do I call it now? Landry light pullbacks, she used to call it kiss ma, M-A, ma, goodbye. Now I call it Landry light pullback. So if you are reading the layman's guide to trading stocks, by the way, if you want a free copy of that, dayblair.com slash free dash book check the comments below i think i have it in the link and i'll give you a free copy if you want anyway you can see lots and lots of landry light and then the landry light goes to zero because once you intersect the moving average the count resets so again keep it keep it super 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 simple as i said a thousand times before and i'll probably see it 
<laughs> in San Francisco again, although I'm not going to call anybody out, but usually people will get up and they'll talk about all their complex things or whatever and all their ways they do things and the counting of the waves and all this other crazy stuff. And then usually they'll have a moving average, just a random moving average on the chart. And I always am shocked how just something as simple as, uh, not an event, Landry, I just put my name on, kind of like, <laughs> kind of like Bollinger put his name on the Bollinger bands, you know, or the uh, standard deviation bands, which is brilliant though. I absolutely brilliant. Not to take anything away from him. Speaking of Italy, I like, I was talking about Italy earlier. Uh, <laughs> my wife's like, who's this guy? I'm like John Bollinger. It's like, what's his deal? I was like, he put his name on an indicator and uh, became famous. She's like, why don't you do that? It's like, all right, so I'll do it. Landry light. There you go. You got it. Because <laughs> before that, it was like everything was like a bow tie or whatever. But I digress. Uh, just something is, and it doesn't have to be my simple stuff. There's other simple stuff out there, but really simple, simple, simple pattern. This didn't turn into mother all winners. I think it was just like a, it, it took off. It's another one of those bottle rocket things. Took off and then came back in, unfortunately. But again, not to beat the dead horse, keep it simple. So there's your Landry Light pullback. Your, and this is something I don't recommend programming screens to, to spit out things mechanically. My screens are very loosely oriented. In fact, I'm just looking for a pullback from recent highs, okay? And I'll give you those scans if you want. But if you were to mechanize something like this or something like this could be mechanized in your scans, but still, you want to make sure you're still picking the best of the best stocks. All right, so just this last one I kind of added in right before I went live, and I just was thinking about it. It's like trading really is a million little things about a million little things. And this was based on what I'd recently reread from Livermore. Speculation is a hard and trying business. And the speculator must be on the job all the time, or he'll soon have no job to be on. One of the stories here that just quickly comes to mind randomly is uh, we had a stock, I think it was KNF, I want to say, I'm pretty sure it was. And it looked great. And I kept it on a little longer than I normally would. It was an IPO. But I kept it on a little bit longer than I normally would in the pullback just because it, I thought it looked great. But it was like day after day after day after day. I, I come in every day and I put on my order. Every day, every day, every day, every day, put on the order. And then I was like, this thing was down. I'm like, ah, this thing's not going to trigger. So I went into the house and had lunch and probably got my ADD probably kicked in. God knows, I probably ended up in the garage, saw a piece of wood or something. <laughs> and I came back in and I checked the Facebook group. And somebody said, uh, hey, we got a trigger in the, in the Landry stock for the night of the setup for today or whatever. And I'm like, oh, crap. And luckily, I was able to get in. But I want to thank you guys for that again. And I could have easily missed a big winner. And if I'd have missed that big winner, I'd have been pissed off. So it's a lot of details. And I'm the antithesis, if I easy for me to say, of a lot of the crap out there, a lot of the guys out there making it look easy. Because if I, if I ever make it look easy, please call me on. I mean, at times it can be, don't get me wrong. But for the most part, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of details and you really, really, really have to be on your game. Now, not to talk out of both sides of my mouth, but I do find that busy traders make good traders because they only trade when conditions are conducive. Now, if you are busy, which is great for my core methodology, just make sure you take a few minutes out of every day to make sure your orders are set up. So I mentioned earlier, I went into the kitchen, had lunch, watched a little TV or whatever, or like I said, found myself in the garage, saw on a piece of wood. Had I put in an entry order, a stop entry order that's all it had to do right then i could have done all those things and i've got a, i would have gotten an alert when i got hit and okay maybe i need to see if there's any action needs to be taken but for the most part there's nothing to do trading is a lot of waiting but it's those key little moments where you have to do something and that's what makes it so damn hard but it's not impossible it can be done all right Let's hop into crypto. If uh, you guys have any crypto pairs you want me to look at, in fact, go ahead and let me know if there's any uh, stock 
else you want me to look at, I'd be happy to do that too. And checking in with my YouTube brethren over there. How are you guys? I need to advertise the show. All right, let's uh, let me get this shared. Bitcoin's been a bit of a bummer. It just can't seem to get going. Uh, remember earlier I mentioned the 230 EMA system, so I put out a tweet on this. So the 230 EMA system would have been a buy on above this bar here, okay? You have you need two bars of Landry lights, and then you buy above the two bar high with a little wiggle room. And when the market's choppy like this, I'd give it a lot of wiggle room. I don't follow that system in and of itself. But it can work out nicely at times. It can also keep you out of a lot of trouble. But you can see that particular signal didn't trigger, so we go back to chopping around. If you back at this chart out a little bit, uh, we still look toppy in here, and it looks kind of ugly. It's kind of wide and loose. Um, one thing that kind of concerns me, and I see a lot of tweets out there, like people think it's a good thing about... Uh, options on these being improved and uh, ETFs and all this other stuff. And we did get an initial pop, obviously, an ETF a while back being approved. But for the most part, I, I think that the more derivatives are out there, the it creates a it creates a artificial supply. OK. So there's no real dollars or less real dollars, I should say, going into Bitcoin. And as I say, probably every week, all the gold in the world would probably fit in my backyard. And one of you guys was kind enough to look it up or already knew it, that the gold is is would fit in an Olympic size swimming pool, all the gold in the world. That's all the gold in the world, okay? But there's millions and millions and millions and millions, billions and billions of trillions of gold being traded, right? <laughs> with uh, options and futures and all kinds of things. So I think that does create a little bit of an artificial supply. It's kind of hard to wrap your head around, at least my head around it. Uh, but I think it does create an artificial supply. I think there's a lot of paper Bitcoin out there, so to speak. And by paper, I mean that it's not real. Um, I know a few of these exchanges have gone under because they never bothered buying the actual Bitcoin, right? Uh, it's been like a, um, what do you call it? I guess like bucketing, they bucket your orders. <laughs> so that's that's been another problem too. But anyway, that's Bitcoin. Ethereum is looking much uglier. So just to, just to show you, and again, I don't trade the system in and of itself, but the Landry light, if you were to short this, be bar one, bar two on the 230 EMA. So the short would have been here on that. And then looks like it's set up again for a short below this low. As you can see, and as I preach every week, the 30 EMA is your best friend when it comes to markets. When we look at some of these shit coins, you'll see that it could really keep you out of a lot of trouble. In fact, let's say, let's say you wanted to buy Ethereum BTC, right? ETH BCC, and you're like, oh, you know, I think it looks pretty good around five cents or whatever. Well. You can see it's imploded from there and it's dropping and dropping and dropping. And that entire run, eyeballing it, what's that, 60 something days, it never, the high never touched the 30 EMA. Anybody know how to plot Ethereum, Bitcoin on stock charts? I couldn't figure the symbol out on that. But anyway, and that would be a good way to show you the land right over there. So as I say quite often, when these things are just blowing and going, you could just buy the stronger ones, these uh, shit coins, S-H-Y-T. Right now is not one of those times, okay? And I have to be frank with you. I haven't been staying on top of my analysis here just because there hasn't been anything to do. And that's one of the million little things that I talked about. That was number, well, I can't find it quickly but you have to do your analysis every day even even and especially when conditions aren't conducive now if you don't find anything to trade that's fine go off and 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 have some fun somewhere else doing something else but make sure 
you get your analysis done before you go or have somebody like me, at least in stocks, I don't have a crypto service, but in stocks, let me do it for you. All right, let's hop over. Speaking of stocks, let's. Uh, any questions on any of these uh, Bitcoins? Uh, Bitcoins, that's not like the old people. There's an older guy at the gym. I was, he mentioned something about Bitcoin to me, and he's like much older. And uh, I'm like, do you own it? He's like, oh, yeah. I'm like, I was kind of shocked at that. Uh, by the way, here's the Landry 100 still up on the screen. Let's see what's the oldest tracking date in here. Um, the oldest tracking date I have is 529. I don't remember exactly when I started rebooted this, so to speak. But you can see that, let's check the percent change. Okay, 214, the ASTS we talked about earlier. So yeah, you can see there's one in here. This comp is down 10%. I haven't pulled it yet. Probably, when did it go in? Recently, yeah, it just went in a few days ago. And see, that's the problem with just buying, randomly buying new closing highs is there, there, a lot of them will go against you, okay? At least initially. And I think that with a small sample size, even maybe as many as 10, you wouldn't, you wouldn't be in enough issues to catch the occasional outlier that goes up to 200, 300, 400%. But I know I'm a nerd and I know you want to party with me, but I think it's going to be fun to, to see where this thing goes. Now, if we get in a bear market, this might go completely to, check, to cash. So cash is treated as an asset class in this particular index or whatever you want to call it. But it's kind of cool. I mean, um, I can't say his or her name, but there's been some, uh, one of them, her has been, <laughs> has been called the greatest destroyer of wealth. And, and I don't want to be, I'm not being shot in Friday because believe me, I've, uh, I've had my share of more than I care to admit of ups and downs, but I'm just kind of shocked where uh, these people who run these ETFs that are just absolutely abysmal, are, I don't know how they still have a job. I just don't, it just shocks me. And partly to be, um, I hate to say schadenfreude, but just part to, to proof of concept instead of going through all this complex analysis and all this justification and going on cnbc or wherever i don't follow all that stuff but i'm guessing they do and explain why you're taking all these positions or whatever it's like well what if you just bought new closing highs <laughs> what would happen and i bet you a thousand dollars at least that well i shouldn't say i'm getting in trouble here but I think $1,000, just doing something simple like this will beat out a lot of those, those famous people who have destroyed wealth with their ETFs. And I'm, again, I think I'm going to get in trouble here because I usually, I rarely, you know, I, I rarely take a shot at anyone because you live in a glass house, buddy. <laughs> it does. Living in a glass house has its disadvantages, but you should, you should see the birds whack it. It's a far side from years ago. All right, let's take a look at the market. Let me get this out the way. Uh, any questions, any individual stocks, any questions, let me know. All right, let's take a look at the P's, S&P 500. So the P's stalled out. They stalled short of their prior highs. As I've been saying, ad nauseum, my big problem with these V-shaped recoveries at high levels is by the time you get all the way back to the old highs, you're very overbought. And it's very hard for the market to sustain that run. Now, there's been a few sectors in here that have defied gravity and did bust out to new highs, and so far, Naka would have stayed there. But right now, the overall market, thats this is a concern, okay? Now, when you look at the weekly, like we just did a minute ago, it doesn't look quite as bad. It just looks like a normal pullback. So that's that's one little glimmer of hope there. But... Look at the daily chart. This is a little bit of a concern. Now, we could walk off this overblock condition. If we could stay around 5,600 and just kind of chop around for a while, then that will build a base. And the bigger the base, the bigger the launch into space. I thought I came up with that, but it was Ralph Alcampora who did that. He's a trip. We met him a while. We, took, we shared a ride with him. <laughs> we were in Seattle at ChartCon last year. We shared a ride with him. He's a, he's a hilarious, great guy. Anyway, uh, he used to be one of the elves on uh, 
the Wall Street. He was impressed that I remember that. It's like, of course it did. Of course I do. Uh, anyway, NASDAQ Composite, big retrace, big fat retrace rally there. I don't measure retraces, but I bet it's one of those um, magical numbers that people talk about on occasion. I wouldn't get too excited about that. What I would get excited about is that it's overbought and it hadn't made it to its old highs, so it just can't quite get there. As I often say, um, learn, learn, do learn about classical technical analysis. Read Murphy's book. If you get a chance, read Pring's book. Uh, read the older stuff too, especially Schaubacher and Edwards and McGee. But don't try to use all that stuff all the time and use it kind of more of a backdrop or backstop to what you're doing, okay? So like earlier, I talked about a quadruple top or a triple top or whatever the case was with those two setups that were shorts, okay? You've had, you have all that bigger picture working for you. You kind of have a little wind in your sails when it comes to a position. So learn about the technical analysis, but also realize there's a lot of nuances nuances with the, with the classical technical analysis. Like a double top, for instance, a lot of times they'll stall short of the prior high, then roll over, or they'll bust out to brand new highs, making everybody think it's the water's, the water's great, the water's fine, come on in, and then it'll roll over. So learn about those little nuances too. But now is that bit of a concern, stalling short of those prior highs. It tried to rally, they came back in, um, I was probably a little too close to the market today when that when that sell off began because it 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 sort of at least initially felt like the market was coming unglued but then it it really didn't come unglued but it was kind of an ugly day I, I, if you're watching it closely especially after such a big rally uh, the other thing and, and I'm just thinking out loud here one thing I do and I can dig out the formula for you if you want but if I'm gonna and I try to do, I try not to do a lot of it. If I just wait and wait, I could do really well with it. But the problem is I don't wait and wait. But with the intraday stuff, if I wait until the range is at least 50% or more and then look to trade, and then today I was sitting on my hands for the most part because I haven't done fantastic with this because I got caught up in this chop, right? Conditions weren't conducive for that type of trading. But I'm wondering, you know, my, my threshold right now is like on a normal day, no gaps or anything. That's a different trading altogether. But on a normal day with no gaps, ideally, I like to see a market move about 50% of its normal range. And that's not counting gaps. That's just counting the normal bar range, okay? So today I think was, uh, I think my screens are off. Let's see if I can get them up. But one, we're, here's where I'm going with that. I'm wondering if the range, if the bar range for today is, let's say, 100% of the 10-day the average range, okay? And then you get some sort of reversal because at 100%, everybody's feeling like, oh, wow, this is quite the move we have here. I better pile in or be left behind. And then the market sells off. So I'm wondering if there's something there where if you have kind of a wide range in one direction and then you get a rollover, maybe a bow tie or something to the downside intraday. So make a note of that and maybe that's something we'll flesh out. And I'll certainly pay attention to it and see what happens. But that's sort of what happened today. You had a fairly, in fact, let's take a look at that real quick. Now I look at a 30 minute chart, but you could probably look at, um, maybe a much smaller time frame for something like this. But you can see this thing shot up. I wonder if I have any notes on that. I'm not easily accessible. But it shot up, and I think we we're like close to 100% of the normal range, okay, from here to here, and then it rolls over hard. So I'm wondering if that would be something that you could, you could trade that wouldn't trigger off. And I think that's a secret to intraday trading is you want something that wouldn't trigger a whole lot. And uh, if you are if you go to my YouTube channel, I, I gave a gentleman from Korea a lengthy answer. He was looking at day trade bow ties, so check that out. I'm trying to, I don't know if it's an easy way to find it, but if I could find a comment, um, I'll definitely repost it in Facebook, first chance I get. But it's a classic Dave Landry stuff I preach every week for the most part. And that was far, he was doing some intraday trading with bow ties. Rusty, Rusty 2000, Rusty 2000 actually closed up 
three quarters of a percent today, which is kind of shocking. But so far, it's stalled out in that retrace rally. So that's a little bit of a concern. EFA shares, though, did make it to a new closing high today, but they are super overbought. These are the foreign stocks, but they did make it past the prior highs in here. So if they can hang around these levels, then maybe they'll walk off that overbought condition. Euro got whacked today. You can see nice uptrend, though. That's actually looking kind of bullish for those who trade the Forex. Gold the commodity right here, well, just shy, I should say, of these, I think it's all-time highs. So that's kind of hanging in there. The radio guys are finally right. Usually the radio guys, like when it's, you know, it's going straight down for years of telling you how important it is to own gold. But uh, they might be right now. But then they're right. Why are they selling it to you? I don't know. That's another story altogether. <laughs> Defense uh, recovered from his V-shaped recovery, right? Yeah, or continue from his V-shaped recovery. So far, so good on defense. That's ITA. Take a look at banks, though. Banks stalled short the prior highs. Again, that V-shaped recovery. I'm not a big fan of that pattern. But give it time and let it work its way out. Like insurance did manage to make it to new highs, okay? And so this is no longer as significant as being overbought, right? Because now we're super duper overbought up here. And if we can just correct kind of somewhat gradually or somewhat orderly, then insurance remains in a pretty serious uptrend. Now, MAGS, another one of those sectors like the NASDAQ and the semis, which we'll get to in one second, stalling out at the prior little peak in the retrace rally. This has what I call a witch hat look to it. If you, it looks like a witch hat, okay? Upside down witch hat, but a witch hat. Anyway, you can see so far it's rolling over. I wouldn't get too excited about the MAGS until we could take out 40 six decisively in fact the way i look at things it would have to make all-time highs and keep on keeping on for a while in the video i know everybody likes to look at that one uh got whacked pretty hard today didn't come completely unglued but technically it's again it's another one of these retrace problems i've been talking about all night and for the last several weeks but the video looks a lot like a lot of the other areas. The semiconductors, for instance, we'll take a look at the semis. Take a look at the SMH. You can see, again, stalling out in that retrace rally, selling off in general in here. To the upside, though, major drugs closed at all-time high. So far, so good there. Financials in general, take a look at XLF, closing all-time highs. And this one did survive the retrace rally. So believe in what you see and not in what you believe, okay? Don't get too caught up in them. I would never buy a market that's that's a V-shaped recovery until it corrects and pulls back. You know, but this starting to look pretty good. We get a nice little orderly pullback in here. It might be worth a shot. Back to the downside, home builder stall short of the previous high. So that's questionable at best for now. Real estate right at these brand new highs. So far, so good there. Utilities doing pretty good. That may be interest rates related health services. Healthcare has been doing really well as of late. Let's see. Let's take a look at what do I want to look at? Um, it escapes me. I'll, I'll think of it in a second. Okay. Any any stock, individual stock picks you guys want to take a look at real quick? Seems like since I started Facebook group, we don't get very many questions on stocks. Matt, what about you? Still up over there? Well, he's up. What time is it over there? 14 hours, it's 14, I'm trying to think of the time difference. So 19 hours? It's pretty early for you. Well, I appreciate it though, I really do. What was the market I wanted to look at? I'll think of it later, <laughs> as soon as I end the webinar. Uh, it escapes me, oh well. Boy, I'm gonna end the show on a low note here. <laughs> well, as usual, I wanna thank everybody for attending. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedules. Anything on answer, David Dave Landry dot com to all of you in facebook i'll see you tomorrow in the facebook group dave landers trend traders everyone else have a great holiday weekend happy labor day uh matt i don't know what monday is but uh, have a good weekend <laughs> uh again everybody have a great holiday weekend and may the trend be with you <laughs> let me try that again <laughs> everybody have a great holiday weekend and may the trend be with you thank you so much you're welcome